Sao Paulo. In 2002, change was in the air. Incoming left-wing president, Lula da Silva, had won over the banks and institutions in Brazil's financial capital. And there was optimism in a country that has over $260 billion worth of debt. But among those who'd elected him on promises of creating 10 million new jobs and alleviating hunger with the Zero Hunger Program, there were now questions. O programa Fome Zero, sem dúvida que é uma iniciativa boa, mas é apenas... The Zero Hunger Program was a good initiative without a single doubt, but it was only a way of treating the disease, not curing it. Because otherwise, we stay with the illusion of giving out a basic ration of food every month. I think that is not the role of the president to hand out food every month. The role of our government is to create jobs, to make sure that the factories work and that they play their social role, right? That's what I think a government should do. Three years before the presidential election, Geraldo de Souza was one of 2,800 car workers laid off by the Ford factory in São Paulo. He was a worried man. This is my home. Four years ago I was paying rent, so I started to borrow some money. Losing my job is very difficult. That's Mateus, Ivy, and she's my wife. My name is Divina. I would like to know why I lost my job. I would like to get an answer because I haven't found the reason for all this until now. Back then, documentary filmmaker John Alpert had offered to help Geraldo. He wanted to know why the global effects of the 1997 Asian financial crisis damaged Brazil's debt-laden economy and cost people like Geraldo their jobs. Brazil has the ninth largest economy in the world, heavily underwritten by American banks. So in 1997, the globalized economy increasingly mattered to it and to individuals like Geraldo. Today, Geraldo has his job back, but the big questions remain the same. His employer, Ford, is the second biggest car manufacturer in the world, but it's fighting a worldwide economic downturn in automobile sales. Geraldo's life and livelihood still seem to depend on the fluctuation of the world's financial markets. When I received the telegram asking me to return to the factory, it was a shock. Ever since I've been happy, the bitterness and the anguish of staying at home are forgotten. When you work, 80% of your problems are solved. I would like to do the following. I would like you to answer some of the questions I've been asking myself about revenue distribution, firms, employment. Why do they fire workers? To make even more profit? Where does all the profit go? I have a special guest here today, Geraldo, Kevin Tynan. And Kevin works for Argus. It's a research company, and Kevin's going to introduce himself to you. Okay, Joel, what we do, and I do specifically, I cover the automobile industry uh, as far as equity research, Wall Street, for our company. Uh, what that means is I study General Motors, uh, Daimler Chrysler, and Ford Motor Company, um, their operations, their fundamental strengths, and then evaluate the share price does Ford make a lot of money here in Brazil? As far as profit, no, they finished the year at a loss in Brazil and for the whole company, so Ford's in a tough time. Eu acredito que aí não dá para colocar um robô porque são peças pequenas e para pegar e dobrar, encaixar não dá. Tem determinados lugares que o robô ainda não, 
não consegue ainda, por exemplo, numa peça, passar assim, teria certas dificuldades para encaixar. Mas muy, muitas coisas a gente sabe que o robô, é lógico, faz. I know, like, like I said, you and your peers take a lot of pride in the vehicles and the quality that you build, but you have to look at it purely from a dollars and cents standpoint because that's how Dearborn is looking at it. Bill Clay Ford, who, who now runs the company and is the great-grandson of Henry Ford, founder of the company, when that guy wakes up in the morning, the, the only, and he'll tell you that he cares about the workers in Dearborn and across the world, and he probably does, but the, the number one driving factor for everybody that puts on their, their Ford tie in the morning is what is the share price and what can we do to increase the share price. I just think that you have to take some of that emotional factor out of it and say, you know, what's going to be the best thing for me going forward. I don't know if it's just because I work in the factory, but I don't agree with some of the things you've said. Of course, I do understand that the director of the company might want to make more and more profit. The more he makes, the better it is. But Ford has already started to lose money with this sort of reasoning. Geraldo wasn't the only car worker laid off in 1999 but he was one of the lucky ones. He got his job back. His friend Bulldog wasn't so lucky. He's been out of work since then, and his world has collapsed. There's some beans, some oil, some salt, a few tomatoes. There is no more God because you are one of the 2,800 workers that were forced to leave Ford. In 1998, you were one of us, remember? I was a good worker. I never took leave. I was not expecting to be fired. And how are you dealing with unemployment since then? How have you lived? It was very difficult. You see, it was so difficult that my wife left with my son. She said, I'm not going to stay in Sao Paulo. You unemployed, me unemployed. We can't find anything. I'm living. I'm all alone in this empty house without furniture. I feel lost here. Every time I think of them, I miss them so much. Even if you leave a company, even if it shuts down, you should keep on believing and fighting so that other people, so that your sons may one day become part of a company and work. Because a country that has no production is a dead country a country with no motivation. What I would like to know is how other workers cope in other countries. What are their salaries? And how do the automobile factories work over there? In 2001 and 2, Ford, which employs almost 350,000 people in 40 countries, announced a plan to lay off 35,000 workers around the world. Geraldo was again left wondering if there was any future for him in the car industry. His new contract expires in 2006. He's not alone. Ford car workers in America are also worrying about an uncertain future. This is a factory that is located 15 miles from where we are. We asked permission to go into the factory. They said no. We asked to talk to Ford executives. They said no. So we snuck into the parking lot at the shift change to talk to the workers. Hi, Geraldo. This is Bob Levy. I work for the Edison Assembly Plan. I'm here with my F-150. Uh, the history of our plan, uh, we've been here since 1948. And it certainly looks as though we're going to close down in 2004. Uh, all of the workers here will probably have a new destination, whether it be retirement or relocation to another plant, but we will have options. A lot, a lot of the morale around here has kind of been uh, flushed down the toilet with no profit sharing and with, uh, you know, the, they're saying that our, our plant's going to close down and, uh, and people, people aren't excited to come to work and people don't really want to go the extra mile that a normal employee would when the company stands behind them. 
I think it makes sense that when an employee knows that his factory will shut down, he finds there is no longer any point in staying except to take his things and leave. But I think that you should keep fighting until the doors close for good. In Europe, car workers have faced many of the same uncertainties in the past. For Geraldo, it's a chance to find out how their pay compares. My name is Paye Jean-Jacques. It's a pleasure meeting you. My name is Geraldo and I work for Ford. Well, I work for Peugeot in Poissy. I started working for Peugeot in 1968. I was eight years old when you started working at Peugeot. Geraldo, I'll show you some pictures from my factory if you want. Oh, yes, I would like to see them. Okay, so this is the factory entrance. That's inside the factory. And that, uh, well, that's me. That's a friend. So, as you can see, Geraldo, my job is to make equipment, to make tools for mounting parts onto cars. I saw that and I liked it. It's a gratifying job. It's satisfying, I like it. Of course, uh, because there is still some research involved. For example, when a worker can't staple a part, onto a car or all that, um, then he calls me and I analyze the problem and in order to make a tool that will help him. That's what tools are made for, because we can't put everything together by hand. How much does a Pejo worker earn today? Well, all that depends on the work you do, right? On your qualifications. My salary is a little less than 2,000 euros a month today. Over here, at Ford, it's about $650. In the United States, the Ford worker makes $22 per hour, which means $5,200 each month. And you, Geraldo, wouldn't you be interested in working for Peugeot in Rio? No way, I'd rather sell bananas on the street. Hello, so I'm going to introduce myself, Jean-François Kondratiuk. I have been a Peugeot Citroën automobiles employee in Poissy for the past 33 years. I am the secretary of the Force of Years, the Peugeot Poissy Workers' Union, which is the major union in Poissy. Ever since I started working, I've been a metal worker. With European committees, we are able to obtain many things. Now I think that the second phase is when the global committees will enable us to improve the lot of Brazilian, Argentinian, etc., workers who work for our group. Peugeot employees in Brazil need to be able to benefit from the same advantages we have in France. And I think this will happen through global committees. If we created a global committee, it would be the best thing that could happen to us, because with the same wages, there will no longer be any differences. Here in São Paulo, a worker is paid a thousand or nine hundred reais, and in Bahia, he is only paid four hundred fifty reais. Then these inequalities would disappear. The government of Brazil's previous president, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, faced many demonstrations against its economic policies. Geraldo took part in the rallies. At the time, he met with the man who was to become his future president. It is almost impossible to pay back our debt. 60% of the Brazilian budget is used to pay interest on internal and external debt. Geraldo's future as a car worker is linked to the global money markets. What happens to the stock exchange in Sao Paulo is affected by the money markets around the world. It's those markets that affect and shape what the multinational corporations like Ford do. And global issues that affect the markets also affect Geraldo. Luiz Esposito, I've been working here at the stock exchange for almost 40 years. When the Tokyo Stock Exchange loses 8 or 10 percent, ours changes immediately by reflex. And the worker who has been fired 
we will also feel this. But on the other hand, when those multinational corporations came here for business, they also came because of globalization. They could have set up factories in other countries. They chose Brazil because of the labor, the expansive territory, the political stability, the peace ever present in our country. These factories could have been created in other countries, as was the case in Mexico or Argentina. And this globalization that brought these factories here will also benefit Geraldo. Brazil's external debt amounts to more than $260 billion. It's a massive sum that Geraldo is convinced will never be paid back. Nor is it easy to grasp the relationship between his country and the International Monetary Fund. So he questioned Nobel Prize winner and former vice president of the World Bank, Joseph Stiglitz. The question of whether Brazil can pay its debt, unfortunately, turns out to a large extent to depend on factors that are outside of Brazil's control. If the international markets decide that they like emerging markets, if they feel confident in Brazil, all these factors would mean that the Brazilian economy would be strong and it would be easy for Brazil to pay its debt. But if the opposite happens, then no matter what Brazil does, it will have a hard time. One hears the story from outside critics that say if countries only did the right thing, things would be okay. That's wrong, because even with the best of policies, you can find yourself hostage to the fickle international markets. For everything, even to fight against speculation, we are forced to borrow money from the outside. That's how the country and its leaders gave in to the IMF. That's the real truth. And as soon as the IMF comes and looks at your bills, you lose control of your country. My own feeling is the responsibility of the Brazilian government is first and foremost to the Brazilian people and not to the international creditors. Globalization has brought enormous benefits to many of the countries of East Asia. Their growth was based on exports. But these countries manage the globalization process on their own terms. So they didn't immediately open up their borders to goods to flood in. They did it gradually. They didn't maintain high interest rates. They had a focus on job creation. There's a fundamental difference between that perspective and the perspective that the approach that in too many countries the IMF has taken. Geraldo, what we are seeing today, three years later, is that capital has become much more mobile. It travels freely across borders. No one asks for a passport for capital. There are no sniffing dogs to tell us if there are some drugs. I think that the globalization, as it stands today, cannot continue. This does not mean that we have to close our borders. No. The problem is that each country needs to care for the interests of its own people. And if you want to globalize capital interests, you must also globalize workers' interests. After his election victory, Lula, as he's popularly known, went to the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in southern Brazil. With Geraldo watching, it was a big test for the former shoeshine boy who'd become president. I'm the one who reclaimed the lot in Brazil. I asked a lot from every administration that came here before me, just as many among you ask of their country. And uh, what I wanted by becoming the president was to be able to act upon my own beliefs. Since Lula da Silva was elected president, Brazil's inflation rate has risen from 8% to 13%. 
but analysts expect it to fall in 2004. In 2004, alongside its zero hunger objective, the government launched First Employment, part of its election pledge, a new program designed to help young people get a job. But for Geraldo and many in Brazil, it is still not enough. We pay our taxes. We should ask for more, blame more. So I think that people, my people, ask too little. I think that the struggle must be continuous. Because Brazil's economy accounts for almost half of Latin America's total economic output, its historic relationship with international donor agencies like the IMF and World Bank hasn't always been easy. The tensions are a factor in the president's policies. It's necessary for the IMF to adopt a language of resource distribution. It's necessary for the IMF, you know, to start to make the difference between economic investment and debt. I think by, um, uh, by following the sorts of policies that promote growth, there, the Brazilian government will have the resources to continue to service its debt. In fact, they have made substantial progress over the last uh, 14 months since the beginning of admin the administration. And ultimately, if international confidence continues to come back to Brazil, uh, the Brazilian reserves uh, to service debt will be substantial. In fact, we've already seen that Brazilian reserves have risen substantially. Again, a vote of international confidence in Brazil. But I understand for people like Geraldo, workers in Brazil, uh, uh, they can be frustrated that at times it takes a while for these sorts of results that show up in economic statistics to filter to the uh, to individual people and workers, but we think the signs are there that that is starting uh, starting to happen, and I think 2004 will be a better a better year uh, for people like Geraldo. I don't think that the interest rates would decrease. There's a great confidence in the Lula administration, but really, I don't think that the interest rates would decrease because of confidence in the Lula administration. Because a bank is a bank, it has always been a bank. And the more the interest rates increase, the more Brazil will be in the hands of the international bankers. Geraldo, I understand you have a question on the future of the Brazilian economy. The interest rate seems to you overestimated. Last year, the interest rate that Brazil pays externally decreased notably because of the international confidence in the Lula administration. We think it's reasonable to think that it's going to decrease more during this year, 2004. I'm cleaning my photo camera because it's becoming dusty. I don't use it often enough. I take care of it so that it won't get ruined. I'm getting ready to take a few pictures today. Right now, I'm doing it because I like it, but I see it as an alternative in the future. I'm sure I'll profit from this. I lived in the streets for two years. I didn't even have the basic necessities. It makes you feel very sad to see people living in such conditions. Very sad. When globalization came to Brazil, we realized that we would have to do more studies, to specialize, because we realized that everything was electronics and technology. 
computadores, tecnologia. Então, so if you don't get ready, if you don't do studies, it's very difficult to enter this new globalized world. It can change. I think that people are able to change, but we do also want to have our say in this globalization. For more information on the issues raised in this program, visit our website, tve.org slash lifeonline. Over the next few weeks, life looks at new policies on land reform, debt relief and health and education.